speaking of Thursday, there's actually a movie called Thursday. Never heard of it? Well, there's a reason for that. Certain movies fall through the cracks due to any number of reasons. The Shawshank Redemption, for instance, had a feeble showing at the box office. Mr. Dufresne's escapades, now known by millions and loved by most of those millions, didn't even make back 10% of its budget on opening weekend. It eventually did turn a profit, making back its budget, and later proved a powerhouse in the home video market. That whole home video thing is part of why you've never heard of Thursday, by the way. Let me explain. Created by the now-defunct Polygram Filmed Entertainment production company, Thursday was shown at a film festival in 1998 to very upset reviewers, among them Roger Ebert, who said of the film, I saw a movie so reprehensible I couldn't rationalize it using standard critical language about style, genre, or irony. The people associated with it should be ashamed of themselves. Apparently, the distributor listened to him because the film only saw theatrical release in two theaters. Not even kidding. The film was buried shortly thereafter, but eventually a DVD release was planned around 2002. It was printed for one week, then Polygram Filmed Entertainment went bankrupt and folded into Universal, who continued the grudge of Ebert and have not made any more DVDs of the film. This whole story is a fascinating sociological topic, with a handful of critics and bad timing leading to a movie getting tucked away into the closet with the other skeletons. So is it really that bad? Well let's dive in and see what all the suck is about. We open on Nick, Dallas, and Southern Drawl buying coffee in a convenience store. Nick's confused by all the choices, Dallas is annoyed at this, and Mr. Unpronounceable gets one of his two understandable lines in. This is a Tarantino opening through and through, complete with random violence and small conversations with pop culture references. What do you like better, Picard or Kirk? Oh, there's no question about it. Kirk. <laughs> you now that Star Trek's been referenced, on to the next scene. Meet Casey living in a suburban paradise, complete with weird neighbors and atrocious mailboxes. Now you may be asking yourself, as I did the first time watching this, what in the world does this have to do with this? Well, nothing. Absolutely nothing, except for the characters involved and the briefcase. That sound familiar at all? We happy? Yeah, we happy. In the fine Tarantino tradition, it's time to link the scenes with clever scenarios and natural dialogue. And put your hands on the wall. What? Turn around and put your hands on that wall. You're kidding, right? You wish. This isn't exactly how I envisioned our reunion going. That wasn't sarcasm either. The chemistry between these two is very believable. And, um. Bro. Quite engaging. It's really Maybe a little scary. too engaging. Nick drops off his things and asks to borrow Casey's car to run some errands. After Nick leaves, Casey finally passes his wisdom check when seeing the briefcase for the third time. Huh? The roleplay metaphor slipped out early. Better hand this off to the professional. DM? Yes? Huh, I thought for sure I'd be interrupting something. What, pray tell, would you be interrupting? Well, the roleplaying. Did you take a night off or something? What? Oh. Don't worry yourself about that. Guys? Where'd you all go? You guys are jerks. Anyway, what's the movie today? Thursday. There was a prequel to Friday? Not at all. Have a watch. Well, I'm not sure how I could, uh, since... What the hell? When did you learn how to jump cut? It's like D have magic for the editing room. Enjoy. Did you enjoy? Surprisingly, yes. So, uh... Why did you show me Splendor first instead of this? Oh, it was just arbitrary episode order. So, what did you think of the premise? Casey and Nick's morning meeting? Perfect setup for a character's retirement session. Good explanation, just needs elaboration. Can't you ever just say, go on? It's just not my style. Continue. Casey is done. His days of questionable activities in LA are years behind him, and he's living with a nice, beautiful wife down in Texas. Suddenly! An old friend visits one day, needing a place to crash for the night. This kind gesture gets him into a whole lot of trouble. Casey discovers his former drug dealing partner is not a former dealer at all. In his rage, he destroys the stash to keep his new suburban life all clean and clear. This is of course when everything shifts to a character ending scenario. Yeah, not a very wise decision. No, because the only thing that's going to piss off a drug dealer more than cabbing their stash is flushing it. Look, Casey's life of crime may be well behind him, but this drastic action, man, it's going to kick off a big series of events that's going to end up getting him killed. Spectacularly killed, but killed nonetheless. Going out with a bang. 
Every character's dream, and Casey's set up to be the 4th of July. Thanks for outlining that, DM. Oh, yeah. Anytime. Did I make Nothing, my saving yeah, yeah. throw? Gotta get some Mountain Dew before someone starts to wilt. Bring up the goddamn Sun and Moon roleplay, won't he? The first of Casey's trials is a pizza delivery. Not a bad start, except that he forgot to tip. This is the man who discovers what Casey has done to the stash, and after a quick phone call, he's ordered to kill the man who threw out millions of dollars of product. The only stay of execution is one final request. I think I could use a little ganj. Drugs. Bringing people together for generations. Not saying I endorse this kind of behavior, but let's just say if you're already offended, this movie may not be for you. Roger Ebert may have been speaking for a more conservative audience, and yeah, this movie is only getting started. After attempting suicide by marijuana, Casey gets the upper hand on Mr. Fari and during an audition for a record deal over the phone. Yes, I'm serious. And it is awesomely out of place. And after subduing his opponent and tying him up in the garage, Casey spruces up and gets ready for his adoption interview. A little contrived, but would it be the worst day of Casey's life if he weren't interrogated by an official while baked out of his mind? <laughs> I'm sorry, we're all out of iced tea. How about a beer? Classy. Yeah. I guess this could be considered the second obstacle, but really? Failing to convince the government that he's worthy of being a father is the least of his worries today. Enter Dallas. Feminist psychology in a shiny red rubber dress. She's the only female character with more than a handful of lines, so of course she gets all the dignified ones. Do you like pornos? Excuse me? Okay, she's a tad outlandish, but eventually she starts discussing Casey's past with the interviewer. This scene is probably what caused most reviewers to hate on this film. It starts with a casual business dinner between Casey, Nick, and a henchman of a drug dealer named Ballpeen. He got that nickname because he takes a hammer to anyone who mentions his embarrassing injury. The nature of his injury is beautifully ironic. He was forcing his way upon someone against their will, which he apparently did often, when he suddenly decided to thrust his member into an orifice with teeth. Long story short, he lost use of it. Kind of a touchy subject now. The anecdote in itself is the controversy here. The fact that throughout this and the next scene, Nick and Casey continuously refer to Balpin as Nigerian, minus the E in and adding a G. Yes, excessive use of the N-word by white people in 1998 would be a little hard to swallow for critics of the time. Because, you know, no movie ever had success with that formula. And isn't it a lovely morning? Up yours, nigger. But my problem with this is that the behavior isn't glorified, so why is it really an issue? In fact, the entire point of this flashback is to show the behavior Casey's trying to get away from, a dark past where he casually treated all other people, regardless of race, with total disrespect. The problem isn't the word, it's that he and all those people were terrible people who were doing terrible things to other people. That's the real problem here, his total lack of respect for anyone. Not a simple little word. This this word should have no power, it shouldn't have the kind of sway that it used to when he used for such hateful purposes because we've grown beyond that and I've realized now that I'm saying it out loud that I'm a white guy ranting about a more casual usage of the n-word and I'm just gonna end this before I dig myself in any deeper.